So thank you so much to Professor Rimuzzi for this wonderful introduction. Um, so now we start with the um, lectures for the um, sort of to lay the ground for the rest of the, um, the meeting. And um, we have three excellent speakers that will give um, some overview um, and some food for thought um, for the, to inform the rest of the meeting. The first speaker that I have the pleasure to introduce is um, Professor David Cavanaugh. David Cavanaugh is Professor of Complement Therapeutics at Newcastle in the United Kingdom. And he will start with the classically complement mediated conditions, atypical HUS and C3 glomerulopathy. So thank you, David. Oh, and one thing, he has 20 minutes plus 10 minutes for questions. From now on, all the speakers have to answer questions. <laughs> Thanks very much uh, for the invitation to speak. Um, I'll just put up my disclosures to start with. And I probably have one of the easier tasks given what's to follow because I'm discussing the prototypical disorders of complement overactivation in the kidney. A typical HUS or complement mediated HUS is acute, mostly, genetic, mostly, cell surface complement activation, mostly, and the effector molecule is the terminal pathway. C3G, mostly chronic, mostly autoimmune, mostly the fluid phase, and the effector molecules are in the alternative pathway with some spillover. So I think many of us were fortunate enough in 2015 in Barcelona to discuss what the controversies were. And what I'm gonna do is look and see what's changed what did we get right and what did we get wrong? Now, um, Carla and Marina are not going to thank me for this, but in 2015, we agreed that the terminology was poor. A consensus over the terminology covering TMAs and HUS should be sought as more information concerning their pathogenesis becomes available. And in 2022, we're exactly where we were uh, in 2015. Now, Marina and Carla are going to tell us uh, what we're going to call this, or possibly not, because it's very difficult. And there is the NKF initiative, but it's not necessarily going to give us an answer. It's all it's going to agree on is that HUS is a poor term. And this is a classification of TMAs. And I think to some people, a typical HUS means anything that is not TTP and chigatoxin HUS. And to some people, it just means complement mediated TMA. And, you know, it is very difficult to reconcile you. Some of it is because you, if you call it a typical HUS, you can give a close them up. But the terminology is poor. We haven't moved forward. Hopefully, the NKF initiative will give us that drive. We're not going to answer this this weekend. Complement pathways in HUS. Well, this is pretty well understood. We know the alternative pathway, factor H, CD46, factor B, C3B, are predominantly involved in the pathogenesis of atypical HRS. Downstream effector molecules, well, lots of things go up and down, but the more things you've got in there, the less you're absolutely sure what causes it. What causes it. But certainly, we know the alternative pathway and predominantly fluid phase activity is predominantly seen in atypical HRS. Well, what's the evidence for this? Well, I think or factor H, factor H hybrids, CD46. We have linkage analysis, we have large pedigrees, we've got replication studies, and they're enriched. You're okay. C3, again, we've got large pedigrees, replication studies, and it's enriched. Factor B, they're pretty rare, um, but we've got large pedigrees and replication studies. Factor I, there are no large pedigrees, no linkage studies, does appear to be slightly enriched. What else have we got? Well, there have now been C2 mutations said to be gain of function. I mean, again, it's early days. We need replication to be sure of this. We haven't found any yet. Doesn't mean we won't find them, but time will tell. You've got vitronectin in the terminal pathways. Now, that seems to be enriched. But again, we need replication studies just to be sure. And then we've got thrombomodulin. I'm going to be controversial here. And I'm going to say that not everything you read 
uh, New England Journal may be correct, just as Ramutsi said. And that's because 10 years ago, 2015, we said the minimum, minimum set of genes that should be screened in HUS include factor H, CD46, factor I, C3, factor B, and thrombomodulin. In the 10 years since, nobody has enriched has shown enrichment in this, and there are no replication studies. So I think we do need to question that. It is a controversies conference. So should we still screen this, or should we quietly let that slip off the guidelines? Other genetic pathways, well, you've got the complement-mediated ones. Adams TS13, we have a biomarker for, so it's rare you will get a genetic deficiency out with pregnancy or early childhood. Cabalion metabolism, we do not screen. And we probably should, because clearly these are uh, eclizumab non-responsive, and there's a very cheap treatment for it. It's said to be paediatric. That's not the case. You will get patients presenting up to their 50s. So clearly we should be screening cabalamin because it alters what we do. DGK Epsilon was just out when we had this. Clearly now we can say it's eclizumab non-responsive. And we should be screening it because it alters what we do. There are developmental uh, genes out there. These have a very specific phenotype. Difficult to say they're eclizumab non-responsive yet, but given the mechanism of action, that's likely. And then we've got nephrotic syndrome genes where we find it's likely secondary to the underlying renal disease in the same way we see TMAs and IgA. And these appear to be eclizumab non-responsive. What else did we say in 2015? We said disease penetrance for an acute episode of HUS is age-related and by the age of 17 may be as high as 64%. Well, that is true in one paper, but actually the penetrance is much, much lower than this. So how do we screen patients? So, And specifically factor I, because as I said, there are no big pedigrees with factor I variants. And so we set out to look at this in the UK biobank screened a million patients for variants in factor I that lead to low levels. So this was not variants of uncertain significance. This was definitely variants that were causative. Um, but causative for what? If you look at mortality, the mortality doesn't change with age. You get factor I variant, it's not causing mortality because the prevalence per age is the same. It does cause AMD though. I mean, highly statistically significant enrichment for AMD, 0 0.001, and uh, if you look at the retina, it gets thinner if you have a factor I variant per age. If you look at factor I, how many got HUS? Of these 1,700 patients with a type 1 variant, how many of them went on to get HUS? None. So, I mean, clearly factor I is slightly enriched in HUS, but how strong a risk factor for HUS? I don't know. The penetrance is very low, so what do we tell relatives? If you get factor I variant, is there any risk you're going to develop HUS? I think probably not, but it's difficult to say no. The other thing we said in 2015 is because of the frequent concurrence of genetic risk factors in HUS, this analysis should include genotyping for the risk haplotypes H3 and MCPGGAAC. Now, I mean, I don't think we're uh, in any way suggesting that this isn't true. I mean, if you look... Most groups have shown an increased risk for these. And it's useful scientifically, but actually, is it useful for the clinician? And should we be reporting it to the clinician? Because it might slightly increase your risk, but the predominant risk is still the mutation, I would suggest. In 2015, we said withdrawal of complement inhibitors is unclear and may be informed by clinical trials. So there were three prospective trials of this. FADIS is already um, finished and reported. And what FADI found was that if you didn't have a mutation, you didn't have a relapse, perhaps unsurprisingly. If, he also found that if you were female and an increased level of c 5 b 9 at the Clozumab withdrawal, you had an increased risk of recurrence. 13 patients relapsed in this trial and they were retreated with Clozumab. Two did go on to have worse renal function and one required a renal transplant. So it's possible. I think there are two other trials coming out. They'll probably say the same thing. 
the key thing is how we monitor these patients to make sure if they do relapse we can get in and at what sort of level should we stop if you've got CKD stage 4 if you relapse you'll probably go to end stage there are questions yet to emerge as to who we should stop in and when so uh, as Beppe talked about earlier there's ravalizumab uh, in purple is the um, eclizumab and the two red spheres are the two uh, histidine switches in the uh, binding domain of a clozumab, that's the only difference in the binding, and that just allows you to uh, separate when you change the pH, classical pH switch technology. And there was no direct comparison between ravalizumab and eclizumab, it's pretty impossible to do those trials now, but in the adult trial there were more deaths, there were fewer patients stopping dialysis than in the eclizumab trial. Is that a problem? Well, when you look at the trial, there was a low mutation rate, very low, most of these patients probably didn't have HUS, 20%, really low compared to everybody else. And that's probably why the outcomes were poor. If you look at the paediatric population, in paediatrics the uh, differential diagnosis is much less. Paediatricians are usually better at spotting atypical HUS. I can say that as an adult nephrologist. And in that trial, 94% of the patients had a complete TMA response. Probably need to discuss when we should use it. Should we use it first line or later on? Pregnancy. Transplantation. In 2015, we were definitive. The decision to use anti-complement anti therapy during transplantation should be based on recurrence risk. We said if you have an early recurrence, if you have a pathogenic mutation, factor C3, C3 factor B gain of function mutation. If you do that, well, that's the UK data, everybody's got the same data, you don't get HUS. And uh, Nicole and Jack completely disregarded that, and they went on to do this paper, uh, where they didn't give a clue to map. Uh, what they did was they used live related transplants, low dose TAC, ACE, type BP control, and people, a lot of C3 variants, same ones, factor H, one factor I, and five had lost previous transplants to HUS. And on this protocol, they didn't lose anybody. They had one relapse, and um, it was rescued with the close map. Do we need to readdress that? The other thing we said definitively is genetic analysis is essential in living-related kidney donor transplantation. Transplantation from living-related kidney donors should be considered if causative genetic or acquired factors are clearly identified in the recipient and the donor is free from these factors. I'm not sure I believe that now. Uh, the recommendation was at a time before we had treatment for HUS in the form of a clozumab. So if you did get this, you were likely to go to end stage. Now, there is a risk of de novo HUS in a donor if you have a functional variant. However, if we're consenting these donors to the risk and the clozumab is available, should we pre prevent a parent donating to their child? So where else are we? What about C5 inhibition and other TMAs? Again, coming back to this slide, this is why nomenclature is so important, because different things mean, uh, different um, classifications mean different things to different people. What is the evidence that this might work in other TMAs? So in the clinical trial of eclizumab, pretty much all of that disappears, and you're left with people with mutations, uh, pregnancy where you don't have a bleed or other uh, things, either the people that have mutation and the group in there where you just cannot find anything else. So where are we uh, looking at what we should be doing in these secondary TMAs? So currently there are a couple of trials by um, Alexion. One is on uh, post bone marrow transplantation with rabalizumab and the other is on the kind of uh, secondary TMAs where you've identified a trigger. Yet to read out, we'll see how they do. What are the emerging therapies? Well, two, crobalamib, it's kind of me too, it's a C5 inhibitor, it's in clinical trials in HUS, and perhaps um, slightly more exciting from a mechanistic point of view is it tacopan with an oral factor B inhibitor being used in AHAS. C3G, well, we have lots of fancy complement tests, we have lots of autoimmune tests, we have lots of genetic tests, but actually none of them are required or 
pretty helpful in making the diagnosis of T3G. T3G is a pathological diagnosis. And there's lots of argument about T3G and immune complex, MPGN, if you, as you've seen. Uh, and these have happened. Fortunately, we don't need to discuss these at this meeting because we've had many meetings about this. One of the issues we've got, of course, is the pathologists we have here are in highly specialist centres. In those highly specialist centres, you're likely to be able to come up with the cause of most immune complex MPGN. That might not be the case to general pathologists all over the place. There is trapping of Ig in sclerosed areas. The more you see, the more expert you get. And how we do know that some, if you biopsy them, will look as if the right immune complex MPGN, and you biopsy them again, it'll be a C3G. And how hard do we have to look? for the underlying cause, i.e. monoclonal patterns on biopsies. And some of this will give us uh, markers of how they're likely to progress. We know if you're fibrotic, like most kidney diseases, you're more likely to progress. And there's some evidence that if you're crescentic, you're more likely to progress quickly. So what causes it? Well, as I said, this is largely autoimmune. 50 to 80% will be C3-NAF of them. Quite a few will also be C5-NAFs, C4 NAFs, and you get antibodies against individual components. In 2015, we said the results of autoantibody analysis require expert interpretation with the relevant relevance to disease interpreted. Um, again, you can really only get these tests in specialist centres. There are multiple assays, and I would suggest there's no single assay that will detect all nephritic factors. And indeed, the more, com the more sensitive ones require immunoglobulin uh, purification. That has to be done in research labs usually. And at the moment, there really is no standardisation. So what are the goal? Whether it's possible? I don't know. More recently, the role of factor B antibodies in post-infectious glomerulopathy. Um, we probably need to discuss that. These may help with the diagnosis, but currently there really aren't antibody eliminating therapies. So the role in how we determine treatment is still unclear. Genetics of C3G and MPGN. In 2015, we said there's no clear benefit of performing genetic analysis of, in every case of C3G. I would agree with that. If you look at the literature, it says up to 25% of C3G will carry genetic variants. Predominantly C3, factor B, factor H, factor I. These are ascertainment cohorts. Many of them have little functional data, and you have to query the enrichment. But clearly, there are genetic causes, because there are familial cases where it segregates. So at the moment, it doesn't alter what we do. Who we should be screening is a moot point. If you do screen, you will find functional variants. But does it help determine what we do and what we tell family members? Therapies in C3G and immune complex MPG in 2015, we said a tiered approach, and that probably still holds. If you've got a, not much proteinuria and a normal creatinine, you'll start with standard ACE statins. More proteinuria, more inflammation, steroids, MMF, and then when you go up to the more crescentic disease, really inflammatory disease with rising creatinine, you go higher with mesalpred, MMF, and cyclophosphamide potentially. Back then, there weren't SGL2 inhibitors. We probably need to assess where they fit in. Anti-complement therapies. So I think 2015, we said the development and trial of complement inhibitors or therapeutics uh, interventions for C3G is a high priority. And I think uh, here, the pharmaceutical industry have stepped up. We've seen the list of people that sponsored us, and that's probably because they have a complement therapeutic. So, where are we? So, you've got alternative pathway agents, factor B inhibitors, factor D inhibitors, and C3 inhibitors. Previously, we tried soluble CR1 to downregulate things. Lectin pathway inhibitors, eclizumab C5 inhibitors, and avacapan. What's read out as best we can so far? So. Uh, not necessarily great data out there that certainly I could find. Um, Denecapan, like so in fact, D, um, single arm trial. Um, only found this in a press release. 
um, clinical response was suboptimal, and they said they had incomplete AP inhibition. Factor D is difficult, especially in renal failure, because the levels can go up. Maybe not surprising. So factor D uh, in the setting of denecapan may be out. Factor B, abstract uh, ASN, uh, statistical reduction in proteinuria and C3 staining, depending on what arm you were in, and stabilization of EGFR. So possibly quite hopeful. Apellus C3, um, slightly difficult to tease this out. They excluded three patients because they said they hadn't taken the drug <coughs> all the time. But in the ones that did, they had five patients and they had a reduction in proteinuria. Not perfect, but we'll see how that goes. And then, undoubtedly, the best trial to date is the chemocentrix trial. It's, it's randomized, it's controlled. And it didn't really give what we expected it to. You would expect a C5A receptor blocker to uh, reduce activity, um, and it didn't. It failed its primary endpoint, at least in abstract. Slightly surprisingly, <laughs> you saw a decrease in chronicity and improvement in EGFR. So not quite what we were expecting. I think we really need to see the fine detail of this trial to see whether it will work. I mean, you would expect from what we've seen with seclusimab, there may be uh, patients that will work in. Lots of these tests, cluster analysis, different complement levels may tell us who's more likely to benefit with what. So the other thing we probably um, didn't address particularly well in 2015 was monoclonal deposits. Uh, we said we should look for them, but we didn't say what we should do about them. And this is always a problem. If you find a, a serum-free light chains, uh, monoclonal bands as you get older are quite common, how do you persuade your haematologist to treat this with an anticlonal therapy? What's the minimum we need? Because sometimes you find a monoclonal band, you see three, C3G and you cannot detect it in the kidney. What do we do? And in these cases, um, should we be adding complement inhibitors to the treatment pathways, possibly while the anti-clonal therapies work? So, what have I said? HOS summary, nomenclature's horrendous. We haven't sorted it. Probably be here in another seven years saying the same thing. Uh, genetics for HOS, it's essential. It determines who will not respond. It determines what happens at transplant, and it determines whether you relapse when you stop. Um, is disease-driven versus continuous eclizumab uh, therapy possible? I would argue it is. Uh, what we need to know is how we look after these patients. So if they relapse, we treat them quickly so they don't go to end stage, still waiting some trials. Uh, transplantation, eclizumab-free regimes are possible. We don't do it. Nicole did. So clearly the evidence is there. Uh, Rabaluzumab is probably as effective as clozumab uh, when we use it, I think it's still up in the air. And we will going to have some trials and secondary TMAs to determine will they work. It won't be easy to recruit. C3G, uh, the pathology is essential. Um, the more experienced people are, the more likely you are to work out what's driving it. Uh, nephritic factors, Highly variable, really only available at expert centres. We could do to get standardisation. That's not happening anytime soon. And at the moment, it doesn't alter what we do. Genetics, difficult to know when you do it. Familial cases are very rare. You will find rare variants. How much they're enriched is difficult to know. Standard therapies, SGL2 inhibitors and C3G, do we need to add them in? And from the data we've got at the moment, the alternative pathway inhibitors look to reduce proteinuria. And avacapan does seem to have had some effect, but we really do need to see the final paper to work out where we should be using it. And with that, I'll stop and take questions.